Okay, okay. There we go. So hello. Hi. To start off with, would you both like to say your names and where you are? Gary Antif. I'm in Los Angeles. And Lynn Jacobs. I abut Los Angeles. I'm in Santa Monica. Okay. So the first question that I have for you is actually, who are you to each other? <laughs> oh my. <laughs> oh, huh. we've known each other since well, mid 1970s. Yeah, maybe even. Well, I knew <clears throat> I knew you earlier than that. You didn't know that, but oh. there was a, a a Gestalt day. Remember the old Gestalt days? I do. Indeed. And so you and other faculty members sponsored a day where you each did little demo workshops. So I saw you in a workshop. I never knew that. And I think that was in 1972 or maybe 1973. Yeah. And uh, I don't know if you know Heather, but then I ended up um, choosing to have Gary Yontef as my therapist, I think in 1974 or thereabouts. About that, yeah. yeah. And uh, we worked together for many years. <laughs> <laughs> um, so is, is Lynn doing okay now, Gary? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I would say it was a pretty successful project. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you're, you're the judge, not me, but I would say. Right, <laughs> right. <laughs> and then it was after that, that um, I guess I became a trainee in the faculty program uh, of the Gestalt Therapy Institute of Los Angeles back in the old days. And after that, and, and so we became social friends after that when I wasn't in therapy anymore. And then it was after that that he and I decided to form PGI, the Pacific Gestalt Institute. Yeah, well, so that's some of the logistics, but I, I, I do want to know who is Gary? Who is Gary for you? For any of you on the faculty of the PGI LA. That's right. I did end up on the faculty. Yeah. So who is Gary to me? Mm -hmm. My goodness. I mean, I'm not sure I know how to answer that um, because he's, because we've had so many different ways of knowing each other. Yeah. But one of the things I think might be, he's been, he's been an incredible support to me always both personally and professionally, even when I may be going places he doesn't want me to go. He still trusts my directions. Mm -hmm. And so I've had the sense that he's always in my corner. And my sense is of, just picking up that last point about directions that I don't agree with you on, You've always been open to dialoguing and we've influenced each other. Right, right. Well, that's the other thing is we've, certainly as our relationship has matured, well, even in the early days, we've influenced each other all along. The I mean, it really influenced me as uh, how to do therapy. That's right. That's right. That's right. Because I, I required very close attention to what was going on in our relationship. That's yeah. what I needed. So it, and that became now a center point of our professional work, the kind of training that we do, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Particularly um, when your pain was more than I wanted to bear. And you called me on it. Right. And that was uh, right. a great experience for me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So who is Lynn for you, Gary? Well, it's compl complex. She's a friend. Always somebody that could rely on her. Mm -hmm. And in later years has been uh, more supporting me than I support her. <laughs> uh... Okay, 
anyway. <laughs> you consult with me about things. I tend not to do that, but you're, you're a, a bulwark of support for me. So our ways of supporting each other are just somewhat different. And some of the mutual support, we just, we don't articulate very much. When we're at the faculty meeting, I really feel the personal connection, even if we're not talking to each other or right. Um, right. level of, of trust and communication. Even. Right. Even when I don't agree with what, what you say. <laughs> <laughs> I feel very personal and attached. I don't know how else to say it. Yeah. Wendy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. See what else comes up of having you two here together then. So my I'm next sorry, question. I'm sorry, I don't see you. I don't see you in person. You know? Right, yeah. right. Yeah. And you and Gordon and Judy and I, the four of us, don't get together as we used to. Right. But I feel that as a attachment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's really right. I I miss that too, and. Our lives are just yeah. <laughs> typical busy LA lives. Yeah. Okay. Well, the next question is more for you as an individual, which is who are you as a person? And that can be anything you'd like to say about yourself in terms of qualities or passions or values that you hold. Mm -hmm. Just who are you as a human being? Back, back up one, one moment, one other thing. Um, in the period when we were doing our civil war in LA and divided into two institutes, um, I don't know how I would have survived that without you. Yeah, yeah. That kind of brings a little bit of teariness to me. That was, you, you were, you were being battered so wrongly. I was definitely, we were clinging to each other in a way, but yeah. I was definitely. Meetings were over and I had to, I had to call you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm glad I was there for you, yeah. It was, we were there for each other, but I understand what you're saying. You couldn't have made it without me. I, I felt that as mutual, but I just wanted to just say it this yeah. way. You know? Yeah, yeah. Well, I had another place I could go because of my psychoanalytic interests. Okay. And so when you say you couldn't do survive it without me, yes, you had nowhere else to go. No, not professionally. Yeah. Yeah. I go to my head and, and think theory. But <laughs> right. Right. But your personal presence is so profound right. for people. Yeah. It yeah. would have been a great loss if we hadn't been able to find a way for you to continue to show up. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> we're, 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 it's okay. <laughs> we're busy. I, I'm a fly on your Zoom wall. <laughs> so can I ask, you know, who you are as people? I mean, you can answer for each other with each other as well. That's fine. It's part of it. I have, I don't know that I know how to address. I can, my passions, you mentioned passions. I could do that one. I am passionately enamored of the art of subtle therapeutic conversation. And I think that shows up a lot in what I write. Okay. I'm definitely passionately in love with that form of psychotherapy. Uh, actually, okay, this is a little bit embarrassing, but what's coming to mind for me is a memory of um, a turning point session that actually I had with Gary many years ago. And it was about uh, this, this could be very emotional for me, but I'd had a dream in which um, there'd been a nuclear holocaust and people were, 
I was surrounded by people who um, were begging for water. They were on the ground and they were begging for water and I had a canteen. And I thought, if I give away this water, I won't have any water. But I started to give away the water and the water never ran out of the canteen. And it was a moment where I realized, as we worked with the dream, it, we started with a sense of I have life to give. And then it moved to I have love to give. And up until then, I'd kind of had this self idea that I had what I was calling a yellow pepper heart, like that I didn't see myself as having a heart that moved out to other people. But the dream was more accurate that I do love, I do care very deeply. And it's certainly showing up in things that I'm doing during the pandemic, but um, I'm paying rent for some people who would otherwise lose their apartments if, if I wasn't paying the rent. It would be an example. I mean, it's not endless rent, but frequently I'm paying the rent. And it comes from a care that I was living but didn't know I had because I was too cut off from <laughs> thinking of myself in positive terms, I guess. So that, that's what comes to me is that I'm passionate about the kind of therapy that I described and, and wealth, the welfare of people matters to me. It's a kind of care that animates my life, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I think that says a lot. Yeah. I've been told also, I mean, I'm talking about who I am. I, I've been told that I can be sort of scary, intimidating. I think I also can be sometimes a bit authoritarian <laughs> in my interactions with some people. I, I don't want to deny that I I find joy all the time that's another thing I love laughing I love seeing the funny even in hard things so and I'm quite aware now of my age and how it's um shifting some of what I'm interested in. And this, one of the things I've noticed is, um, boy, I realize I'm leaving out something important I'll circle back to, but is that I'm less interested in learning new things at this point in my life. Um, I'm, I'm following my passions and they're not taking me into necessarily new directions. But I realize I'm leaving out something pretty important. Like I don't want to write articles anymore, um, but I'll write book reviews uh, sometimes. But a major sort of personal slash professional pattern is understanding what it means to be a white therapist in a racially divided country. And I'm pretty active in teaching and have been writing on that subject, both in the Gestalt world, but also in the psychoanalytic world. So, I don't know. Yeah, I do I'm... want to come back to some aspects of what you mentioned in a moment. Sure. So just you should have a... Sorry? You have some a little background... hearing you had. Yeah, there's some background oh. rattling. I don't know. Oh, go ahead. Oh, that was, yeah, sorry. Um, I hear you right yeah, about I'll come back to a couple of things that you said. Okay. Yeah. But I'm wondering who you would say that you are today, Carrie. <laughs> yeah. Who were you as a person? You still talking to Lynn? No, you. No, oh. I'm talking you now. So I'm, I'm very much aware these days of a trajectory. <coughs> Um, from how I was 
uh, when I was a kid um, and still am at some level. Um, I think until uh, I got into gestalt therapy, even that's my first um, therapy and uh, psychodynamic therapy at social work school, uh, very isolated emotionally, very out of touch. And as a kid, even out of touch intellectually, um, really out of it. Um, and I came alive with the kind of interpersonal engagement in gestalt therapy. Mm -hmm. Some of which I wouldn't advocate doing necessarily. <laughs> <laughs> Some of the stuff from Fritz. But yeah. um, um, so I could feel myself, eventually feel my body, feel the engagement with other people, um, feel the resonance from other people. Um, and in a sense, that's who I am. And I have trouble doing that socially because of my same stuff I had as a kid, <laughs> you know. And, um, I feel very attached in my, my marriage, um, somewhat socially isolated, um, and now I'm really feeling age. Um, mm. It's one of the things I've always had is a lot of energy and I don't anymore. Mm. Um, um, getting to the point of aging where I'm feeling aches and pains that are interfering. So it feels like a whole trajectory from an out of touch kid to being alive to whatever this is on the downward slope. I also have no interest in writing articles anymore. I'm even less interested in, I'm even not as interested as I used to be in oh, reading the high level Gestalt stuff. <laughs> um, don't tell Dan Bloom. Okay, he's a dear friend. <laughs> but I know. I, 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 lo <laughs> I love Dan. I love what he's doing. But no, I'm not. I can't. I don't want to do that. And I feel the same. Uh, I have never met him in person. But Gianni, um, great stuff. And I don't want to put in the energy, uh, intellectual energy, at, at this point in my life. Yeah. I don't want to work so hard. And that, that actually is one of my questions, you know, is where are you in your life right now and how are you experiencing this age and this time? It's hard for me uh, anymore to be uh, in emotional denial about death. Mm -hmm. I used to work with death very well because it wasn't real. To me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but now I have to realize, oh, I may want to live forever, but I can't. Yeah. So, yeah. I feel the downward slope. Yeah. yeah, that's interesting. I've been feeling both both directions, downward and upward slope in a sense. I mean, um, my husband's name is Gordon and Gordon and I have been really grateful Grateful for having each other during the pandemic and grateful that we get along well. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> and um, and we decided to get this puppy because I want a, a, a jogging partner <laughs> and I have to jog <laughs> for my health, walk and jog. So that feels like it's pulling me in a direction of life and vitality. And yet, as I said, I can really feel my aging loss of loss of energy, loss of interest in learning new things. Yeah. And, lo and a reduction in capacity yeah. for learning new, mastering the higher level philosophical slash epistemological shifts. Yeah, I'm not sure about the capacity. I'm sure about the lack of will. <laughs> mm. No, I, I feel like I struggle with the capacity for it. I'm sure, I'm sure yeah. it's true for me too. Yeah. Okay, 
So another question that I have for you about how you're experiencing this in your life is how you have come to experience and understand privilege and power in your lives. I don't know if you mean how did, how did let's say, I learn about it? Not, not so much the learning, but how you experience it and how you understand that in yourself. Probably what's most important to me in terms of addressing that question at, at this moment is um, a humbling awareness of my gratitude about my social position that then kind of turns my stomach but I'm just really aware that I'm relieved that it's not me for instance that I'm not George Floyd you know and then that that's the thing that that turns my stomach so that's a kind of reckoning at a personal level about for everybody, somebody in my position, that privilege has been laid bare by the pandemic. But that's something I already, you know, had a grasp of and was dedicating myself to educating others about. So right now, this more in this personal level, it's this awareness of, of what it has cost others to give me the life I have that I cherish. I cherish this life. And so that means somebody else has paid a price. It, 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 it's, I don't know. I'm, I, I guess I'm feeling more at a gut level the relief and, and tangled up pain of my position. I don't, I don't know if that's addressing what you're asking. Yeah, I, I mean, some people, the, it really depends on where your awareness is. So it's it's a very open kind of question. It's not like there's a right answer. Yeah. So I'm wondering where that sits with you, Gary, in power and privilege. So, um, I have a long uh, in, history and interest in that that particular question. Um, at one point, I wanted to be a lawyer, and I, but I got a master's in political uh, science and political theory. And my interest was against author uh, abuse of authority. Mm. Um, I was, when I wanted to be a lawyer, I, I wanted to defend the uh, those that were unfairly accused or couldn't afford lawyers. I mean, I was very passionate against the abuse of power. And part of my identity was not of privilege. But my identity through most of my childhood was feeling like a, very much part of a Jewish minority mm. and not a part of the power. I felt. Uh, anti-Semitism in schools and uh, the tax in, on, uh, in our house. And so my identity, I know I'm white and middle class and I never had to worry about a meal, um, which I am very appreciative of, but I identify with being against abuse of power. In fact, one of my uh, observations going into mental health, coming from political theory, et cetera, is that therapists didn't ha have pay any attention to issues of power. Mm. Um, Especially Gestalt therapists. Huh? Especially Gestalt therapists with our talk about horizontality. When they talk about what? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear Lynn. 
especially gestalt therapists, because we don't we we value this thing called the horizontal relationship. No, I think it's uh, even more so in classical anal analysis too. Oh, well, really? That is a power differential, not just a blank screen. It's not all uh -huh. projection. There's an assertion of power and a, a privilege to know the truth. That's even stronger than in gestalt therapy. Right, got it. I know it's different in relational analysts now, but no, but I, I, now I realize what you're meaning by power. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's not just the political power, all kinds of personal power. Uh, I am very grateful that most of the time my rights, and then I have a little disagreement about the word privilege. Because privilege can be taken away. Privilege is like a uh, zero-sum game. I think we all have basic rights. And many people, for example, Black people in America, have their basic rights uh, abused all the time and have to live with that. And I am uh, less, um, I don't know, well, you talked about how much it hurts you, and I'm I, for me, it gets me in, in anger. I'm outraged um, that their basic rights are taken away. Not that they don't have privilege; their basic rights are are are, are abused all the time. And so I feel very passionate about that. At the same time, I am also aware of the abuse of power. By the protesting minorities, and I don't mean blacks now, I mean in general. The Russian Revolution is a good example of that. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen authoritarian kind of abuse of power within the liberal movement before the races you killed. Mm -hmm. And I don't believe abuse of power in, in the service of fighting against abuse of power is something I, I want to ignore. Mm -hmm. It's, it's interesting because for me, just since what, what's formed us in the directions we take the issue of our status as, as whites right. is yours is coming from that history of having been treated poorly as a Jew. Right. And my interest in specifically in race issues comes from having grown up in a segregated part of the country with liberal parents. So it's yes. just, and, and I, I want to tease you and say, you were the shiksa. Yes, yes. <laughs> and totally protected by that. And yet quite aware of the segregation and what that, so yes. we're really shaped in our, you know, yeah. we're animated by those childhood experiences. Yeah to focus on different aspects of the prism of inequality in our culture. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I think that influences, you know, how you would see any aspect of the prism, right? So uh, I actually would like to ask you both, what comes to mind as an event or something particular about your circumstances in life that you would say has really influenced who you are? An event. An event or a set of circumstances. Mm. And I know it's field theory, it's not cause and effect, but. <laughs> yeah. I mean, does something come to mind as a turning point or something that marked your life? If not, that's fine. Yeah, um, I don't I think of two series of, of experiences. Um, I don't know if it quite answers your question, but go anyway. <laughs> um, one is that my life was profoundly changed um, in dating and, and marrying my wife mm -hmm. because I was so isolated emotionally, romantically, all sexually, also. <laughs> and um, it became a different, a very different from that. And, that was one set of things. Um, and I don't know if I'd, I'd still have that or lose it if, if something happens to her. Um, 
The other is um, uh, my experience in therapy with Jim Simpson. And I know <laughs> your experience was so different. No, but I was going to come around to that my therapy experience with you was life changing. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Because uh, when I w was at Eslin in an advanced seminar uh, workshop, which I had no qualifications for, but they put me in an advanced workshop with Fritz and Jim, and I worked on being confused with Fritz and then with Jim. And working with Fritz was a disaster. I mean, in inwardly. But with Jim, um, he focused me on what I was aware of and staying with, like the awareness continuum. So my confusion, uh, describing it became a fog, became alive. So I had to be aware of being aware of being aware of being able to stay with my experience and with somebody that, that was interested in that and that would contact me. To me, that was life changing, both by me individually, but also as a therapist. <laughs> I'm just enjoying that if we if we circle back to that story I told about the dream and I have life. Yeah, and I'd love to give the therapy with you. I mean, you know, we'll, we'll call it what we want to, but I'll say schizoid. You know, my schizoid isolated. I'm not saying stuff. that anymore, Lynn. You're right. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but the therapy with you brought me alive. So that's life changing. I've never retreated. I've never lost that gain mm -hmm. of knowing what it means to feel alive and caring about it and reaching towards it. Yeah. So, yeah. so that, that would be one certainly life changing 10 year period. <laughs> You know, the other, I think, for me, is just the experience of growing up in a family where there was a mix of genuine empathy and care, particularly from my mother, much, much more than my father, who was very self-involved. So there was a background of care. I could feel safe in a certain way in the family, and yet it was always from a distance. So mm -hmm. that's the schizoid part. So that really shaped my personality. People can know, can know that I care for them and keep them in mind. And I, I, I'll just say, my, my husband talks about this, that he, I overheard him once years ago saying to his sister, I know she loves me. I can't feel it in a direct way. And that's still, I mean, that as, as, as much more alive as I am now, still there's that sense that, that my care for people is quiet and subtle, not very overt. And it comes from growing up in a kind of schizoid family. So. You know, I know they love me and I can't feel it directly. Bingo for my family. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> yes. I, I have to tell you, for years, I told Gary that he was schizoid. And he said, no, I'm not. No, I'm not obsessive compulsive. Long <laughs> after I ended therapy with him, he confessed he's also schizoid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. hmm. So I, I want to ask about one more um personal aspect of yourselves, which is how you experience and understand yourselves within your gender. How we understand ourselves what? Within your gender and that part of your identity ah. or your masculinity or however you choose to call it. Hmm. The first time I realized that there was a significant difference between being a boy and being a girl in a certain way, in terms of moving about in the world, was when I wanted to be what's called a congressional page. 
and this was 12 years old, I think I was, and you apply in Washington, D.C. to work in the Senate or the House of Representatives, and you run messages back and forth. And I had the shock of finding out that you had to be a boy to do that. You couldn't be a girl. And I was stunned. And it was, it was that experience of, walk, of running into that glass wall. And I didn't know why that should be. I mean, I, it was just this stunning. I mean, I think there's a time when a kid learns about, a, a black kid learns about race, has one of those moments to it. Well, my, that was my gender moment. And um, I, I have to say, I don't pay a lot of attention to my gendered self, even though that moment was very striking for me. Um, I've, I've, I don't, I can't even say I know what it means to feel like a woman. For me, when I think about female gender, I do think more about power and issues and power imbalances and structural issues. Um, all I know is that the more embodied I am, it doesn't strike me as a gender thing. So I'm very comfortable um, being in my gendered body but I'm not oriented around it as gendered. Okay. I don't even know how to answer that really. Um, I, um... I feel always sort of uncomfortable as, as a male, but not very um, male aggressive. Um, uh, always kind of like what the girls and women seem to have that us boys didn't have. <laughs> and, the difference was wonderful. <laughs> are, are, are you talking there about the intimacy that women we women get to have with each other, straight and gay? No, there is that, but more deeply than that is um, caring, softness, um, uh, uh, intu intuition about emotions, and I know it's overgeneralization, but right. uh, my experience through early life was us guys didn't have it, and the women seemed to. And I like that. I mean, I, I felt important. Right. Um, so, oh, I had an association. <laughs> I sure this must tie in. My mother always wanted a girl, not a boy. Mm. She had two boys. Uh. She talked about that a lot. Mm. As if it's a joke. <laughs> uh huh. That's interesting. My mother wanted four boys and got one boy and four girls. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I have an, an uncle. He was just two years older than me, and he lived with us for a while. My mother was the oldest; she was the youngest, and he wanted a son so much. Uh -huh. And he had three girls. And he's told not to have any more because of RH factor or something. But he had to try once more and got a fourth girl. <laughs> but it's interesting because neither of us is centered very much in gender. I mean, except in a political way. I think we're both very sensitive to it politically. Right. And we both have that same history, too, then, yeah. of parents who may do with the wrong gender kid. Yeah. It's interesting. I hadn't made that connection. Me neither, till just now. Yeah. Okay. So this is uh, switching things a little bit. In now, I, I heard a little at the beginning about how Lynn found Gestalt. I'm wondering how you found 
gestalt, Gary. And if there's anything you'd like to add, Lynn, please go ahead. No, I did find it by accident. A friend said, come to this gestalt. No, that's not true. When I was in college, I was given the book Gestalt Therapy Verbatim by my then life partner, um, who actually just recently died of COVID, unfortunately. Um, not my current life partner. But That's my stand, right? Yeah, yeah. He died two weeks before the vaccine was going to be given to his center, yeah. living center. Um, but so I knew I wanted to learn about Gestalt therapy when I came to grad school in LA. And this classmate said, well, there's this Gestalt day happening. Come with me and we'll go see it. So. Well, it was sort of more accidental for me than that. I was working at the state hospital. Uh, this was when I was psychiatric social worker. I hadn't got, got my doctorate yet. And Fritz gave an annual kind of uh, a series of uh, workshop copy in-service training. And um, those were the days when we had lots of uh, release time from the state. It was a good, t a good time. <laughs> and it was, I was intrigued by uh, what he did. And then I went to Esalen, et cetera. But um, I had no advanced interest in gestalt therapy in particular. I was going to workshops on various things, reality therapy, and, uh, family therapy by Ackerman, the, you know, the New York analyst. Uh, um, but it's the vitality. Huh? It's the vitality that you saw in Fritz, I bet. Yeah. Well, two things. One, I, I love, he was talking about Oriental theory, and he, um, which was, I just studied it. And so I liked that. And I liked the fact that. Oh, no. Was he mislabeled something. Anyway, it doesn't matter. <laughs> we lost you, though. We didn't hear it. it you froze. What? You froze. Oh. You liked what? What part? You anyway, like, I, like, I, like, I like what he said theoretically, but the emotional impact was uh, he got he got to people. He didn't actually get to me, but he didn't pick on me. <laughs> um, he knew I was out of it, I think, um, or too well defensive. But um, I worked with an um, a, a older uh, psychiatrist who was a, had been a, a, a Hornean training analyst and came to LA to retire, sort of, but he's the sharpest guy around. And Chris had him reduced to frustrated tears, which just amazed me. How can anybody do that? <laughs> so, Did you meet Arnie? Was huh? that where Arnie would sometimes go? Yeah, right? Arnie, Arnie Beister was the director of, of training and he brought Chris in. And, uh, so my experience was uh, how we could reduce the the, the, the psychiatric power of people to, into into uh, not the, into into being emotional, um, and the reports from the other he, he did a back to back thing with the psychiatric residents, and later they reported it was the most um, um, learning thing they had had, and they would never do it again, never ever <laughs> do it again. <laughs> Excuse me, I need to close my door. My husband's finished his meeting. So I'm I don't have I don't want to ask specific questions. I just really want to open this next piece up for both of you, which is to ask out of all of the things that you have done and experienced within Gestalt. What feels meaningful for you about your work and what you've found and what you've built? I mean, for me, it's the same thing as kind of what I was saying before about what I love, which is the nuance of subtle here and now conversation. And, and dialogue. I mean, when I first read Fritz Perls, the Gestalt Therapy Verbatim, this idea that I could be in a room with someone who would be that attentive and present 
yeah. with me has been the through line in all of my interests, both in Gestalt therapy and in contemporary psychoanalysis. These, the meeting, <laughs> the meeting. And, you know, that certainly was driven home in the work we did and in the work we now teach. And it's still what animates me is the meeting. That connection for me also, like in, in for example, in therapy, um, but also the work we did clarifying it theoretically through the 80s, um, particularly um, spelling out first the dialogue and calling it a relational therapy, putting it in linear form. Right. Giving, giving a, a theoretical uh, collaboration right. and um, the awareness work, uh, tying it in with uh, basic phenomenological method and anti, um, uh, uh, um, Cartesian. Right, post Sorry, I just had a senior moment. I couldn't <laughs> yeah. think of the word. Yeah, that's interesting because you say that and I think both you and I obviously have done a whole bunch of work on developing the theory, you know, taking dialogue and putting it as the centerpiece of, yes. of the entire realm, if you will, of Gestalt therapy theory. And I realized, oh yeah, I used to like to do that. <laughs> um, but I used to like to do that. You know, I mean, obviously it was my dissertation and et cetera. Yeah, yeah. But it still is always coming from that ground of what it's like to be in the consulting room. Mm -hmm. And we have these moments and then we want to try to talk about, well, what do these moments mean? How, how are they so meaningful? And we keep building around that over and over and over again. That's part of what your teaching is so good at, frankly. I get, really? I get you, Gary, I get too heady sometimes with it. But you really do keep bringing it back to ground over and over again. Mm -hmm. Just saying. <laughs> yeah, and some of our, uh, uh, we've had nice dialogue. Where you've been plowing ahead and I go back to ground. <laughs> yes, to ground. yes. You, you, call, you pull me back from the cliff's edge all the time. <laughs> And on the theory side, uh, that I value a lot about what we've done is our writing about shame. Yes. Now everybody's writing about it. But right. That's true. It wasn't so, so talked about when we started. That's true. Yeah. 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 I don't know if you know, Heather, but our residential, for those who have come, survived it, and return, so the ones, they're the ones that like it, they call it shame camp <laughs> <laughs> now we're trying to get them to say shame resilience camp <laughs> too cumbersome yeah no i i'm one of the ones who signed up for gary's shame camp that he brought to mexico it was it was wonderful and that i mean that was a very life-changing experience for me actually huh. Huh. so I, i'm wondering what do you want to say more about that? Why is that meaningful to you, or how? That's shame. Shame. Yeah. When you try to relate at a vulnerable level with uh, uh, with each other, not only in therapy, um, there's stuff that get get in the way that operates for most people at a level they're not aware of it, just mm -hmm. of the consequence, mm -hmm. and that's the shame thing. Mm -hmm. And what we run into are people um, having trouble with the awareness work, with the diet, inter interaction, relating, um, because they're, they're, they're organized around their defense against shame. Mm -hmm. Because what is just a little thing at one level is all about how uh, they're not acceptable, lovable, okay as a person. Mm -hmm. And when that and that's underneath and not given air. Um, it's very powerful. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, there, there's that and there's that. 
Well, it's it's really picking up on what you're saying, Gary, which is that what's made it possible for me to come alive, number one, and to work dialogically is working with my shame and becoming resilient enough with my shame to be able to recognize it, own it, work around it in the service of the patient or face it head on in the service of the patient. It has mm -hmm. it's been the major impediment to my coming alive. So, and I think that's true for an awful lot of people. Isn't it interesting that I didn't say that, uh, what I said, which is absolutely true of me. Yeah. yeah. That's how I can. Yeah. I mean, I think that's part of why, why our work was so meaningful to me. I, I realize our work was also meaningful to you. But part of what was meaningful to me is that you had done work on your shame. Mm -hmm. So you were willing to engage in a dialogue. You were willing to think maybe Lynn's got a point there. Uh huh. And I need to take a look at something. I mean, that, that stance in and of itself mm -hmm. was so valuable. Yeah. Sometimes I take that for granted. Yeah. Sometimes what? Sometimes I take that for granted. Oh. <laughs> yeah, don't take that. No, I know it's not when you when you talk right, about it. Right, right, right. Well, I'm also wondering um, what challenges you have both run up against doing the work that you do as the people you are. <laughs> I have a story to tell you about that. <laughs> <laughs> so once I took a transcript that I had made of um, three sessions with a patient, word for word transcript, because I was in supervision with Bob Stoller, a group consultation with Bob Stoller, who is an intersubjective psychoanalyst. Um, and he was having us do these transcripts. And um, I was going to present them. I did present them at a Gestalt conference. And Gary was actually one of the panelists at the Gestalt conference who did not like the work that I did. This was well after I, I was no longer a patient of Gary's. And so we could get into tussles. This is the one about the borderline patient? Uh, I don't know if, it, if we did a diagnosis of her, but you basically were saying I was too interested in the attunement aspect and not enough in something bringing forward my own subjectivity enough. Oh, Remember yeah. Bernie, Bernie Brickman was one of the analysts who spoke. And, um, but I showed, this, I showed this transcript to two psychoanalytic friends of mine and they said, you can't present this at a Gestalt conference. It's full of interpretations. I showed it to two Gestalt therapists who said, you can't present this at a Gestalt conference. Um, no, you, oh, you can't present it to two analysts because there's not an interpretation in it. <laughs> and, uh, it's all in the eye of the beholder, if you ask me. But um, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the tr one of the things that we've, I think, run into trouble with or run into some resistance with is people saying, well, um, one, one em um, preeminent author in particular keeps saying that I'm working from a one person perspective, that that author doesn't see to me the value of my intention towards attunement as a starting point for dialogue. He, he sees that as too much of a one person thing. So I, I run into that sometimes. I do run into people who worry that I'm not addressing defenses and resistances enough. Um, and in the Gestalt world, I, I run into that kind of issue. In the psychoanalytic world that I'm in, I run into problems with people saying that my willingness to self-disclose impinges on patients, even if they look at the transcripts and see what then evolves. So it's like these knee-jerk reactions. Yeah. They don't feel to me like, you know, I'm defending myself here, but they don't feel to me like they understand really what I'm getting at. And right. 
And then us as a pair, we run into this thing about, is this really Gestalt therapy? What would you say, Gary? Where, where are you running? One, my almost always answer to that is, I'm not interested in whether it's Gestalt therapy. <laughs> Forget about it. Is it good therapy? Right. It, let's need it. Right. Uh, yeah. um, and on the issue of interpretation, and I say, you still doesn't interpret, I say the total nonsense. Right. Right. I mean, we don't we don't interpret the unconscious ahead of the patient's unconscious because we don't right. believe it's, in a the unconscious. You can't be a phenomenologist and say you're not interpreting. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, that that's such a biggie. Yeah. This thing about we're not interpreting because everything is interpreted. So. You know, uh, and the issue of gestalt, whether it's gestalt or not gestalt, when I see Donna Orange working at our residential. She's clearly an analyst, but you wouldn't know she's not just all from her, her, her kind of engagement. Right. Because she engages dialogically. She's interested right. in dialogue. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. 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 And it's, it's the, the core of it. And whether you're doing an experiment or you're working with body or you're using movement or you're just doing the kind of work we do most of the time, it's, uh, it's the kind of connection you're making. Right. right. Yeah, you know, I think also, together or, or is it uh, me? The one person is I've got the truth. Right. And this is this is part of what led to our deciding ultimately to build our institute. I mean, I think we, we just have to acknowledge, too, that although there were many complicated reasons why the Gestalt Therapy Institute of L.A. split and you know, led to GATLA and PGI. One of them was a profound philosophical slash ethical slash technical set of differences about what it meant to be in dialogue with patients. That's saying it so diplomatically. Yeah, well, uh, I don't, I, that's <laughs> what I prefer to do at this moment in time. Yes. I, I appreciate the diplomacy. <laughs> well, it, right. I, it operated at a personal and then a faculty level and in, in relation with the training. Right. That's what I mean by it's complicated. It showed up at all different levels. That's but what I was the, trying to say. The freedom, yeah. to, to, the freedom to propound our theory and practice styles without all that resistance has been liberating for both of us. I mean, we just took off after that. That's when our writing really yeah. took off and our teaching took off because we were free. Yeah. 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 I think on the issue of one person, I think sometimes we err on, by we, I mean, relation, us, relational guys. <laughs> um, on the side of uh, not working enough with the defense mm. and being reflective can be in effect, not just preparing for more dialogue, but also can be not present enough. Yeah, see, that's, I think, where, you know, you and I can end up in a long conversation about this, but I see it a little differently. Okay. Because if I'm if I'm talking with the patient about my experience of being with the patient, we're working with their and my defenses, if you will. Right. Yes. So we don't that, have to speak about that. Right. That would be okay. So that would be my pathway for that. I guess I'm not thinking about what you do or what I do so much as um, the, what our trainees may do with. Right. Yeah. This is where we're not teaching well enough. I know you better. I know that when you do, it is. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. But we're not conveying that well enough then. That attunement well, is the growing of, edge of how we present it. Yeah. 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 Right. Right. So, but when you say relational guys, there is one piece I want to throw in here for anybody who has listened to us long enough to get to this point. <laughs> I have a bug up my ass about when people say um, that's not relational. 
and am I working am I working relationally enough when they're asking uh, when they're saying, if I'm not asking the patient to pay attention to our relationship, does that mean I'm not working relationally? Or if I'm mad at a patient, does that mean I'm not working relationally? And I Go, just, man, I, I'm right with you. <laughs> yeah, so when we, when we say relational, what we mean is that everything that's happening in the office is, em is relationally emergent. Right. So if you're angry, it says something about what's going on in the relationship. And if the patient is doing their work and you feel engaged and you're taking a ride with them, then why would you need them to pay attention to the relationship? I have these two, yes. two things. I, want, I have these two sentences that I keep in mind when I'm working all the time. One is, how is my engagement with the patient right now right, facilitating right. the next emergent moment or the dialogue or their awareness versus how is my participation in the dialogue inhibiting the flow of their awareness or the mm -hmm. flow of the contacting. And I don't need to ask the patient, sometimes I do, but I can ask those questions of myself. Right. And if by sitting in the background, the patient is on a roll and I feel engaged, why would I not say that's working relationally? Because I'm paying attention to the relationship. I don't need the patient to do that. Another version of that question, I'm right with you, um, is like sailing. You're right. always correcting. Right, right. That's great. That's a wonderful analogy. And that can help us with our students when they're getting freaked out about, I'm not attuning enough. Well, that's because yeah. there's something else in the water that's pushing you this way that you need to correct by perhaps speaking of your experience. That's great. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Little piece of theory. And that's okay. It's, it's interesting because I mean, at this, I don't think at this point in your lives, I can separate you as human beings from your gestalt selves, right? I mean, I think this is definitely an experience of who and how you are. So, I am also wondering about the term Gestalt community. Do you feel like you're part of a Gestalt community and what has that meant to you? Hmm. Boy, yes, but if I was asked to define it, I'm not sure I could. I mean, I certainly feel it, a sense of community in our PGI world, which extends around the globe because of the people who come to the residential. I feel sort of peripheral to a larger, no, peripheral to the IAAGT world because I don't get involved in any of the governance issues and things like that. So I like being able to afford to go to the conferences so that I can see people in person that I don't usually get to see, but I don't. I don't feel extruded from the community. I, I don't feel like I contribute much to it. So I'm sort of hanging out on the edges of that. But I feel a strong gestalt identity and a connection to others who also feel a strong gestalt identity. I would say there's gestalt communities or that it's layered. Oh, that's, yeah. The small or communities as a subgroup of a larger community. Yeah. And I feel identified with or uh, a member of like the IAGT, but as a very inactive member. Mm -hmm. I'm not interested in being more active, but I am feeling identified with, with mm -hmm. or. Um, That's a good way to say it. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. And, yeah. That's, I just, Okay. So I'm also wondering, I know this isn't again a very big question because it's a lot of years and it's a lot of experiences. How would you say Gestalt has affected you as a person? Affected us what? As a person. As a person. How has Gestalt affected you? Well, I, th I think we, I covered that by saying it brought me alive. <laughs> That's what I said too. It 
yeah. kept me in touch with me and my body and uh, with other people and connected. Yeah. And it's why I like hanging around Gestalt therapists. Got to I realize yeah. that um, I love my analytic world too, but there's more posturing, more carefulness not to hurt anybody's feelings. So it's less alive. And I, I think you're Stefan saying that the analytic community, oh, they don't hug. Yeah, right. Right. Actually, they do. But he was back in those days, maybe they didn't. But I can yeah, feel yeah. much more relaxed in my Gestalt world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Did you want to say anything to that, Gary? Or is that okay? No. Uh, uh, I feel the coming alive and comfort in the Gestalt community, and, you know, in general. And even if I'm hearing um, uh, a presentation, on the one hand, and then the, Gestalt, the degree to which I get emotionally affected, not intellectually, I can deal with the analytic uh, presentation, but the degree to which I'm affected and feel at ease. I don't know. You know, it's interesting because in my psychoanalytic community, uh, what I'm known for is speaking in a way that reaches people's hearts. Is what? It, it, it's speaking in a way that reaches people's hearts. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. What I'm, and of course, to me, I'm just speaking the way I learned to speak as a Gestalt therapist, right? Right. <laughs> So the another question is what comes to mind as a peak experience or a favorite story? I do ask for storytelling if you would like to. Is there a particular moment or a story that stays with you about your Gestalt experience or about a different part of your life if at this point you want to bring something else in? I don't know if I have peak experiences. Um, I mean, I feel so alive. I'm not sure I even understand what the question is, actually, because I'm coming up dry. But, but what is a story, what's a story that comes to mind that's meaningful to you about your life as a Gestalt? No, I mean, it's like everybody, well, a lot of people, I guess, there's a, you know, a story that you tell and your kids have heard it 50 times and all of your students have heard this time that this thing happened. Uh -huh. I hear the doggy. <laughs> um, hmm. I draw a blank. Yeah, that's fine. I that's fine, blank, actually. Also. That's perfect. So now I would like to know if there's a question that you have for each other. Huh. <laughs> I, I was going to make a joke about something like, do you love me? <laughs> <laughs> Do I love you? <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, you actually sang a moment. <laughs> um, I don't... God, we know each other so well. I don't, yeah. I don't know that I have a question. Uh, uh, I don't think I have a question for you. Yeah. Yeah. Asked and answered at this point in your relationship? Yeah. 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 yeah I'm thinking, gee, is there a question I could have asked her and didn't? And well, no, I can't. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I, I, I never find myself musing about something yeah. un unknown that I want to know about you. Hmm. Yeah, no unfinished business, huh? <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Well, let's put it, seems like, it seems like you were you work dialogically, right? So if you have a question, I can imagine you've spent the past 20 years asking each other the questions, right? right. right. I guess the only question I could ask you that I haven't asked is I don't know if it's a nice statement or the question. Uh, <laughs> are you okay with all the administrative stuff you do? <laughs> You've been doing that work so long. 
Yeah. Much longer than I did it when I was in the, in the administrative chain. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I no, worry about you a little bit about that. <laughs> right, right. No, I can't say I'm okay with it. I, I'm not, if what you mean is do I resent it or something, I can't. No, 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 I, no. No, sometimes I, I, I don't do it very well now because I'm overburdened right That's now. The part I'm yeah. About. Yeah, like I'm about to do our our taxes, and I realize I'm doing them sloppily, and hoping that our accountant will take care of the loose edges. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, it's the overburden. No, I know I, I don't pick any sign of you resenting it. it yeah, anything. no, no, because I I mean actually, I feel like I've still got some of the easiest of the admin stuff to do mm. compared to what the others have been coping with until we hired. A certain yeah. person named Heather. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, I don't think I'm helping you out much there. That would actually be a whole other series, you know, administering Gestalt. What does this look like when you're not just in a therapy room with people, right? right? right. But my my last question for you then, both, um, is really what's next, and that's what's next for you as a person or in your practice? And what do you think is next for Gestalt from where we are now? Ooh. I may have a better answer to the second than the first. In the second, I'll say something that I said at the EAGT meeting that I was one of the keynoters at, which is that I think a lot of fresh thinking is coming out of Europe now. Yes. And that the, our new directions in Gestalt right now are centered in Europe, the ones that I'm aware of anyway. Um, like, there's a lot of creativity south of the U.S. border, if you will, in, in Mexico, an, an incredible amount of creativity. So actually, that's another place that's a future, like, if, we're com if we could combine the creativity that's coming out of Mexico and part south with the intellectual sophistication that's coming out of Europe, that's our future. If you put those two things together, I think that's our future. Um, do I hope dialogue doesn't get lost? Absolutely. But the... I don't see it in either case. I, I don't see they're using the same language in both areas, but the same attitude is happening in both areas, both Europe and Mexico. And then personally for me, my future means no more writing articles, occasional book reviews for psychoanalytic journals because they want me to write book reviews based on my interest in race. So I do that. I, that's sort of a, an ethical commitment, I guess. And I, I'm not working as many hours, and that's intentional. I don't imagine myself losing interest in this work. It's hard for me to imagine unless, unless I become ill, like where it actually affects my body and my mind. Um, but I do look forward to getting the amount of work I'm doing into more manageable proportions, so, which is happening. Well, the, the personal issue is relatively clear for me in that um, I don't imagine my losing interest in doing my individual and couples work. I feel engaged. Um, in, good for me. <laughs> um, but I've cut way down purposely. Mm. I work maybe half the hours I used to work. Wow, good for you. And I keep it around 20 hours. I used to work many more. Mm -hmm. uh, I used to do several groups a week and consultation groups. Mm. And I don't do any of the groups or consultations anymore. Mm. By the end of the day, I don't have the energy to, <laughs> to do groups. And I don't want to have to keep them up. Right. So I'm cutting down. Um, and in, enjoying what I have left, you know, I mean, the individual practice and seeing couples and occasional book review for the 
one of the control journals. Um, we'll do that as a more of an obligation than a passion <laughs> anymore. <laughs> um, future Gestalt. You know, I'm a little out of touch because I don't travel anymore. Mm. Um, I, I, feel, I hear and I, I'm a little affected by the intellectual um, creativity coming out of Europe. Um, I borrow s several things from Gianni, even though I can't read even a portion of his writing. <laughs> um, I don't know what it's like in person. I hear he's a good guy, but <laughs> um, I, I don't know what the, what the practice of gestalt therapy is under all of that so sophistication. <laughs> he's very contactful. What? <laughs> he's very contactful. I heard that about Gianni, yeah. Yeah. But again, it's all secondhand for me. I don't. Right. And the energy out of Mexico, and, yeah. yeah. But I don't, I don't, I don't know what's going to come out of that. It seems to me there's still a bifurcation of the people that, for me, have the creativity and the energy. And the people are still hawking mm, empty chair and that sort of uh, old style stuff. Mm. So I don't see that as the future. Yeah. Maybe that's wishful thinking. <laughs> I, I can understand why you don't travel anymore. I must say, I still love the teaching. And your name comes up a lot, of course. Yeah. I miss the teaching. I don't miss the travel. There... I, don't, I don't miss the time alone in a strange city. And then, uh, uh, oh, I like that. Yeah. And I'm mm. less fond of lecturing. Mm. I still like that. Yeah. Yeah, I know. You've always you've always been, uh, enjoyed that more than I have. Yeah. But I'm enjoying it less than I, than I used to. Okay. Well, I'm wondering if there's anything that either of you would like to add to this particular conversation, because I am out of questions. I don't think so. Hmm. You gave I us- I've, I've enjoyed the conversation. <laughs> you, you gave us hard questions to cope with. I, I, well, I, I'm unilateral. It's, it's the same for everybody. It's, it's all, yeah. So thank you. I really appreciate your time for finally having decided to sit down and do this. Um, if it's okay with you, we'll leave it here then. All yes. right. Thank, thank you. you. Bye.